All right, good morning. We have little we have little to do and much time to do it in. So Yeah, we're only looking at 18 verses today. Easy easy peasy. So last week we looked at the introduction to John as as an overview. Today we're going to start taking up the text itself, uh, beginning with the prologue. You can divide John up any number of different ways. Uh, One of the most obvious, though, is simply uh, Jesus' earthly ministry prior to his, his passion and crucifixion, and then his passion and crucifixion. Uh, but his passion and crucifixion take up like half the book. John goes into a lot of detail the, the, last, the last days of Jesus' life before his crucifixion. Um, if anyone needs a Bible, they're over there on the shelf. Um, I'll have the English Standard Version that I'll be reading from, but... Uh, We'll also make some references to the Greek. I won't get too crazy with it, but um, it is important. But, but yeah, oh yeah, the Greek's right here. It, yeah, if you remember, the, the Greek of John is simple grammatically, uh, but that, that doesn't mean that the book is simple or simplistic. There's a lot going on. Let's open with prayer and then we'll, we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness toward us. We thank you for sending your Son, the Word. We thank you for sending the Spirit that we may know of your Son, that we may believe in him and have eternal life. Send your Spirit through your Word according to your promise, that we may know and see your Son, Jesus, that we may identify him as uh, the fulfillment of all the prophecies that you made through the prophets in the Old Testament, and that we may recognize him as the light and the life, in whose name we pray. Amen. So, I will read the first 18 verses of John 1, and then we'll go back and we'll we'll focus on things, not just verse by verse, but probably phrase by phrase. So John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So the reason for reading all of that is because the first part of that prologue, that reading there, you have the introduction of the Word, 
And then in, in verse 14, you have kind of the bookend, more about the word. This word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, as we mentioned last week, John makes a lot of allusions, not illusions, but allusions to the Old Testament. Not explicitly in the way that Matthew frequently does. You know, this was done in order to fulfill what was said by the prophet Ezekiel or, or Zechariah or whatever. But rather, this, uh, this is an allusion that you, that you kind of grasp by knowing the Old Testament. And the first thing that you see here are the very first words, in the beginning. In the beginning are the first words of what book? Genesis. And also John, right? So John is, is showing that there is a relationship between the gospel account that he's writing and the book of Genesis. Now, it's easy to say there is a connection. That can be kind of lazy, actually. I hate it when theologians do that. The more important question is not, is there a connection? That's lame. The connection is, what is the connection? That's the better question. How is it connected? Well, John will tell us. Um, the, first, the first thing to notice, in the beginning, does not necessarily indicate the start of time, like, a, like an inception of a period of time. Greek verbs, Greek concepts of time work a little bit differently than they do in English. In English, verb tenses are strictly uh, related to, to time, past, present, future. Now, we don't know how many verb tenses we have in English because there's so many, maybe. Um, but in general, they're related to past, present, future. In Greek, a lot of it has to do with what's called... Um, aspect, where it's not merely that it happened in the past, it happened in the past and was completed in the past, or it happened in the past and remains completed in the past, or it was habitual in the past, right? The meaning of this verb was here is important. Because of what? Controversies regarding the nature of the word made flesh, right? Um, when we say that the word was with God, we don't mean he was then but is not now. That's kind of how English works, though, isn't it? You know, I was at home. Where do I expect to find you? Not at home. That's not what's going on here. Was is, in, in the, the, the tense of the verb in, in Greek indicates he already was with God. So when God created the heavens and the earth, in the beginning, the Word was already with God. He had already been with God because He eternally is with God. During the, the, the Christological controversies around the Council of Nicaea and afterward, we talk a lot about this because there are people who deny that the Son of God is, in fact, true God, that Jesus is Himself God. And so, John's gospel gets used a lot in, in defending uh, the Christian truth against the heresy of Arianism, which denied that Jesus is truly God. Um, in calling Jesus the Word, or in, in calling the Son of God the Word, it's hard to fully explain the, the depth of meaning to this. Now, as, as Lutherans, we understand that the word has power, right? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing by the word of Christ. In saying that in the beginning was the word and the word was God, what we're talking about is that God has a will. I don't mean like when he dies, who gets his stuff. Not that kind of will. God has a person and he has desire, right? 
There are things that he wishes. As God, that which he wishes is done. God's will is certainly done even without our prayer, right? The word of God is the enactment of his will. The word of God is the enactment of the Father's will. You see this all over John. One of the clearest places is in your favorite verse from John, chapter 3, verse 16. Right? And English, again, lets us down with that adverb, so. The word is not so much. God so loved the world means, in the following way did God love the world, colon, he, he gave his only begotten son. Thusly did God love the world. In, in this manner did God love the world. He gave his only son, right? So that when, when the father wills something, he works through the son. Um, now, if you have encountered Jehovah's Witnesses, they will, they will use this verse and they will say what? They, they, they will change it and translate it to the word was a God, a God. Changes everything, doesn't it? Uh, Greek doesn't work that way. Greek works a lot like English where you don't have to have the word the on every single noun. Um, and still there only be one of them. So like... Um, John 1.1. 1, 1. They would say, and the word was a God. The, the, the simplest, most straightforward translation by, by any standard rules of Greek is simply going to be, in the beginning was the word, and the word was toward God or with God, and God was the word, or the word was God. As a matter of fact, that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father is all throughout John. You can't, I mean, you can't deny it. Um, the preposition with, the word was with God. It works okay. I think that the English is following Jerome. Jerome translated into Latin as apud, with God. Um, but the word in Greek is, is, the word was turned toward God. Prostantheon in the Greek. In other words, in, when, when God created the heavens and the earth, the word was already with him, and he was turned toward the Father. Right? What does Jesus pray in John 17, in what we call the high priestly prayer? He prays that his people may be one, right? As he and the Father are one. Now, does the Father, do the Father and the Son each possess his own will? Yes. The Father has a will, the Son has a will, the Spirit has a will. That's why they're different persons of the Trinity. Each person has his own will. How does the will of the Son differ from the will of the Father? It doesn't. The will of the Father, the will of the Son, the will of the Spirit are united in an arrangement we call theologically love. The will is bent toward the good of another. And you see this very clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? The Son has a will, and being fully man, his will is, if it be possible, let this cup pass my lips. Yet what? Not as I will, but as you will. The Son is a distinct person of the Godhead. By the way, when in the church here does this reading come up? Christmas Day. This is the text for Christmas Day. Christmas Eve, we talk about the facts of Jesus' birth. Christmas Day, we talk about what exactly was born that night. Right. That little baby is God. So, 
Anything else on, on verse 1? I mean, we could spend weeks on verse 1, but I'm, that's not really an exaggeration, though. There's actually there's quite a lot there. Verse 2. All things were made through him, and the him here is the word, right? All things were made through the word. The word, as we know already, is God. And without him was not anything made that was made. So all things are made through God the Son. Now, in the Catechism, when we talk about creation, we usually attach that to which person of the Godhead? God the Father. Does God the Father have any role in creation? Absolutely. He's the one who speaks. Does God the Son have a role in creation? He's the Word. The speech of God, right? And John tells us that everything that has ever been made was made through Him, that is, the Word. So, while for the sake of catechesis, we talk about the Father and creation, the Son in redemption, the Spirit in sanctification, the Father is not the only person of the Godhead involved in creation. Does the Spirit have any role in creation? Moses tells us he's hovering over the waters, right? There's the Spirit right there. This is an act of the triune Godhead. And it's one of those things where when Jesus reveals this to us in the Gospels, you go back and read Moses and you're like, oh yeah, there it is. Now, it's, it's obvious that the Old Testament saints had a sense of, of the Trinity even if they didn't have you know, the fullness of the Nicene Creed. But now, especially once Jesus reveals that God's name is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you go back and you read and you go, oh, so when David says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, he's saying, God, don't leave me. Oh. You know. Likewise, in redemption, does God the Father play any part in our redemption? You bet. He's the one who sends the Son, right? He's also the one who turns his face away from the Son so that the atoning sacrifice could be made. Right? So here John is saying, the Word, who is God, who has been from the beginning with God, is also involved in creation. Nothing was made that was not made through him. Verse 3. Um, in addition, there's a distinction between was and became, or, if you like your King James, came to pass. In the beginning, the Son exists. He is already with God. But in time, certain things come to pass. These are different verbs, right? In Greek, ain versus agenita. Um, already existing versus things coming into, into existence in time, right? So we human beings come into existence in time. We're not eternal. Now, we don't have an end. but we don't exist eternally before creation. Only God does that. What was there before there was creation? God, right. So here we're talking about things that are coming into existence, or more formally, creation. Verse 4. In him, that is, in the word, was life, and the life was the light of men. Right. So here, the word is called the life and the light. It's one of those things where the words that it's you know little bitty short words, but. The depth of meaning there is 
you, you, you can't possibly mine it all. What does it mean that the word is the life? What does it mean that the word is the light? The answers to those questions are found all, in, all throughout John. And they'll really culminate when Jesus raises Lazarus, won't they? Because what does Jesus tell Martha? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I try to understand general relativity and my brain partially liquefies. And that's something within creation. What, is, what does it mean? Yeah. What, what does before creation even mean? There's, we, have no, we have no reference for that at all. What, I mean, what does eternity mean? Have you ever, you ever tried to contemplate eternity? Does not compute. The, the, the worst thing, my flesh, I mean, speaking only for myself, my flesh, when it contemplates eternity, immediately thinks of boredom. Now, that's one thing you know will not be true. Boredom is sin, and we will never be bored in the new creation. Okay, so then, what is eternity? All I know is it's good. Life. Okay, so um, I'll give you the, the English transliteration. Greek has two words for life. Zoe and uh, bios, right? Um, when we talk about life as, you know, living organisms, we talk about biology, right? Comes from that version of that, that Greek word. Zoe means like, get a life. You know, or what, what life am I living out? In other words, the way in which we live. This is, this is the word in the Bible uh, used to describe the Son of God, the word. He's the life. So it's, it's not just breathing more. That's, that's bios, right? It's not just, you know, cells keep going without dying. It's actually living out a life. You know, biology can tell you all about how, like, mitochondria get, you know, produce energy and all that kind of great stuff. But biology doesn't really answer what are you supposed to do with all them cells. That's, this is what we're talking about is what, what life are we to live out? How are we to live? So thank you for bringing that up. Um, you see now a contrast. John is going to talk about light and darkness. Right? And again, very simple concepts, universal to mankind. We all know what darkness is like. We know what light is light, like. Um, but the depth there is, is tremendous. And so, he says in verse 4, John does, that in him, that is the word, was life. The life was the light of men. Now, in calling the sun the light of men, this, this idea, and, and he's going to come to it again later in the, in the prologue, the light is not just merely... Um, you know, internal illumination like some Eastern guru, like, you know, I've, I've, I've seen the light. You know, like a Blues Brothers revival kind of thing. It's, it's more like light in terms of w why do you not walk around in the darkness? You want to see where you're going, right? So light shows the truth about what's around you. Now, the light might show that your floor is dirty and you've got to be really careful. But at least it shows you the truth. That's the sense in which the, the word is the light. He's illuminating the world, bringing truth into the world. So, I mean, the concepts of truth and light are very closely related, right? In the light, it's hard to lie about the state of things. This is why so much deception is done in the darkness. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Huge. Yeah, huge. Yeah, excellent. This is precisely the sense in which light is meant. But go ahead. Yeah, the entirety of the will of God. Yeah. Um, in Psalm 119, how is light described? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, right? In other words, it, it shows me the way I'm to walk. It also banishes the darkness. Yeah, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about Gnosticism a little bit as we go through John. I won't get obsessed with it, I promise. But um, it, it's, it's not unimportant. And, but the, the thing of it is, what is Gnosticism? It's an important question to ask because 
one, you'll, you'll find elements of it in almost every man-made religion, but two, um, you'll also find some, in some ways an obsession with it in modern apologetics, and that's equally unhealthy, I think. Gnosticism comes from a Greek word gnosis, which means to know. Gnosticism, you're, you're not generally going to meet someone who goes, hi, I'm Dave, I'm a Gnostic. It doesn't work like that. Um, Gnosticism has all kinds of different forms, even, even corruptions within Christianity. But Gnosticism is usually identified by, at least in my opinion, two things, and that is, one, uh, claims of, of secret knowledge, right? And that knowledge tends to come from within, right? That's the sense in which light does not mean. It doesn't mean merely an internal illumination. It really means an exterior illumination that, de that shows the truth uh, around one. And, and specifically in Psalm 119, not only does it shine light on, on the world around you, but it shows you the way you're supposed to walk, right? The light is, is there for the purpose of showing you the path. Also, Gnosticism will in general involve some amount of repudiation of the body. For that reason, describing Gnosticism to sinful man is a little bit like describing water to a fish because we're all kind of prone to it. You know, so um, the idea that, you know, we're, we're not bodies, we're, we're spirits inhabiting bodies. That's Gnostic. It was also C.S. Lewis. But it's Gnostic. Are you your body? Yes. Did God create us with bodies? Yes. On the last day, will we be fully man, body, and soul? Yes. This body? Yes. This very body. But not subject to decay, not, not capable of sin. No glasses, no doctors, no death, no tears, no pain, no loss, right? What's that look like? I don't know either, because I've only known this world, and that ain't this world at all. But I think many, many people have the idea that, the, that the, the world to come is one of disembodiedness. That is true for a time until the last day when the graves are emptied. Then we get our bodies back, reunited body and soul, fully human, eternally. What's it like to have a body that doesn't decay? Yeah, I don't know either, because that ain't, that ain't this life. But um, Gnosticism will say something like, you know, what remains is only the shell, the nut has gone. You know, that kind of thing. The idea that the body is a prison to be escaped. Which is tempting, right? The body is limiting. <laughs> but the body is part of God's creation. God made our bodies. Our bodies are us. So that, like, when your brother hits you in the arm, you don't go, you hit the arm of my body. No, you go, hey man, why'd you hit me? You did hit me. That's, that arm is me. That's me. Like, when you, when you see a picture of someone, you don't go, that's a pictographic representation of the body of so-and-so. No, you say, that's so-and-so. Right? Their body is them. So, um, Gnosticism is going to involve some degree of downplaying or escaping even the body. And so in John's gospel, it's a big, big deal that he talks about the flesh the way he does. In John, in, in the way that John describes the gospel, the flesh is not something to be escaped. Rather, it's something that God takes on himself for the purpose of redeeming us in the flesh. Well, in, in, in John, the light is really not a what, the light is a who. Yeah, why doesn't that person who can't see anything, why doesn't he recognize the goodness that lay just beyond his perception? Because he can't see it. We need the light to see. Precisely. That's, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. And that's how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit in his farewell discourse in chapters 14 through 16. He's going to take what is mine and give it to you. In other words, he doesn't say, I'm going to show you the seven steps to find what belongs to me, and then you can take it for yourself. He, he knows, so weak and helpless are we, that he gives us the paraclete, not parakeet, paraclete, that's his word for it in John 14 through 16, the helper. He will take what is mine and give it to you. Because he knows who you are, right? You, he's going to place it in your hand. Right? Six, uh, verse 6. Verse 6. 
So now John goes from talking about the Word in a, in a sort of contextless, sort of like eternal way. Now he goes to the, to the person of John. Understand that there's a guy who wrote this book whose name is John. There's a guy who bore witness about the light whose name is John. They're not... The, John, do you ever have a problem where there's more than one John in the room? Yeah. yeah. So, so does St. John the Evangelist. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so so this, this John, in the synoptics, they solve that by calling him the Baptist or the baptizer. In the interest of full disclosure, I don't like either the term Baptist or Baptizer because they're both... I mean, right, I mean, they both mean the same thing, but Baptist, I mean, there's a denomination that calls itself Baptist, and he, was, he wasn't that. But also, I mean, Baptizer is just clunky. It's just clunky English, but what, whatever. This is what we're stuck with. Um, but it's John, the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah, right? So... Notice, you don't have a long narrative about the birth of John the Baptist. You don't have, you know, the, the song of Elizabeth. You don't have the visitation. You don't have the angels. Why not? Well, you... But Luke spends a lot of time on him. But that's exactly it. Luke already spent a lot of time on him. John doesn't need to go over all of that because you have Luke, right? Right? You're not intended to only have the one gospel. You're, I mean, the Holy Spirit intends for you to have all four and read all four. And so you want to know about where did John the Baptist come from? How was he prophesied? What were the events of his birth? What was his mother? You know, all that. You've got Luke. And it's in, it's in Mark and, and, and Matthew as well. In John, it's just, bam, here's John. And, but what are we told about him? He was sent... He was sent by God, which is what John testifies of himself, right? I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Now notice, John, both John the Evangelist and John the Baptist, are very clear about the nature of John the Baptist. Who he is, who he's not. So John the Evangelist, St. John, the one writing this book, says he came as a witness. Now, you might know this, you might not. In Greek, the word witness is the word martyr. Right? The word martyr is simply the Greek word for witness. So, by the way, how does John the Baptist die? Beheaded for what? Witnessing to the truth of God's law. Yeah. You can't take that woman for your wife. What are you doing? You can't do that. And he lost his head for it. And the martyrs will suffer to one degree or another. Uh, for example, St. John the Evangelist, according to tradition, it's not in the Bible, but according to tradition, uh, is not killed for the faith, but it won for lack of trying. Um. There are others who suffer for the faith who don't die. Luther, for example. Huss, yeah, he did die. They burned him. Cyprian? Yeah, he suffered. Transliteration of John? What does his name mean? Oh yeah, Merciful is the Lord. Yeah, it's a great name. John's a great name. That'd be why so many people in the New Testament have it. <laughs> um, in verse 8, you'll notice John the Evangelist mentions, you know, he, he came for the purpose of bearing witness about the light, right? He's going to identify the light. How does he do that? 
He's preaching, he's preaching repentance for the coming kingdom. And then he gets to preach the single coolest sermon any preacher ever preached. He just points to Jesus and goes, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No, no sermon can ever top that. Just point to Jesus and say, hey, that guy I've been telling you about, there he is. How great. But that, that's, that's what he was sent to do. He was sent to be the one preparing the way and to point them to say, okay, we've been preparing now. Here he is. This is him. Follow him. Listen to him. That's the light. So that's, that's what it means that he's bearing witness about the light. He's, he's, he's not only going to suffer for it as a martyr, but he's also going to bear witness about the identity of the light. Who is the light? It's Jesus. Strangely enough, John will save himself toward the end of chapter 1 in, in, in John's Gospel. He'll say, I didn't recognize him. Now, Jesus was a cousin to John the Baptist, but the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal Jesus' identity to John until the time has come for him to bear witness about the light, which is why John says, I, did, I think it's verse 31, uh, I didn't recognize him. And yet, when the Spirit you know, moves John to preach this, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now he's bearing witness to the identity of the light. Here's the true light that's come into the world. Right? So, notice in verse 8, though, John the Evangelist is saying he was not the light. Why does he say that? Yeah, this is also what John tells the Jews, right? I am not the Christ. Who are you? I'm not the Christ. He's very adamant that he's not the Christ. His ministry is preparatory. In fact, he's going to say, I must decrease while Christ increases. Verse 9, uh, for whom is the light, uh, whom does the light enlighten? Everyone. This is enormous right? This is enormous. It's it's a big, big deal in in the book of John. For whom did the light come? Not merely for Israel according to the flesh. Not merely for the Jews. As a matter of fact, a little bit later on in this chapter, John is going to say he came into his own, his own didn't receive him. So in, in, in John... Those who were to receive the gospel are called the world. And this is precisely what it means in your favorite verse in John. And I don't say that mockingly. It's your favorite verse for a reason. It's beautiful. God so loved the world. Right? Now, all throughout John, you're going to find that the world is hostile to Jesus you're also going to find that the most hostile are the ones who knew the truth of the law of Moses. The world, however, is set up in opposition to God because the world is ruled by the prince of this world. His time is passing. It's to those enemies of God that the light is to shine. Not merely to the Jews, but to the whole world. Yeah, the gospel call is to go out to the whole world. I mean, that's, that's the command. Imagine believing that Christ didn't die for all. You'd have to say, I mean, you'd have to say something to the effect of, well, maybe Christ died for you. Or because of your works, you can identify that you are the ones, one of the ones for whom Christ died. I mean, not only is, is universal atonement the, the, the Bible truth, it makes preaching so much easier. Christ died for all. Are you part of all? It's like the easiest logical deduction, Right. Christ died for the sins of the world. Am I part of the world? Yep, okay, Christ died for me. How do you figure out if Christ died for you? Are you human? Congratulations, Christ took on your flesh and died for you. Doesn't really go further than that. It's a logical deduction, but it's a very easy one. Um, But in verse 10, you see that the word has a very almost complex relationship with the world. He creates the world. Everything in the world that was created was created through him, through the word. 
Nothing was created that wasn't created through him. You were created by the word. And not, not just Adam and Eve and then, you know, the laws of nature take over. You personally were created by God and you are personally sustained by God who knows you and knows how many hairs are on your head. He's not distant at all. He's very close. How close? In verse 10, he came into the world. He doesn't just sit far out of his creation, clucking his, his tongue and going, real shame about humanity. I had high hopes. He gets his hands dirty. I mean, first off, he takes on hands that get dirty. He, he enters into his creation, right? So he creates the world, and then he enters into his world for the purpose of what? suffering and atoning for the sins of the world so that they might have life. So next week we'll talk a lot about the mystery of the incarnation because um, it's, it's giantly important. If I can make giantly a word now. Um, it's giantly important in the Christian religion. As a matter of fact, in the Athanasian Creed, we say two things you got to believe to be saved. The Trinity and the incarnation. So... All things in the world were made through the word. He came into the world. So the whole world rejoiced at his coming, right? No. Because when he came into the world, he came into his own. Who are his own? The, yeah, the Jews. Right. He, he came to his own people. So... There was all this promise made to Abraham, your seed will inherit this land. Repeated through Isaac, through Jacob, Judah gets the promise. You get promises made to David that are a repetition of this, plus, you know, your son shall be a great king. The scepter will never depart from David. It's not David. He's not, he's not the fulfillment. And it's not Solomon either. Not to, not to spoil first kings for you, but it's not, the Messiah is not Solomon either. Um, but from the Jews, from the tribe of Judah from the house of David will come the fulfillment of all of this. And John tells us he came into his own, which is why it's necessary in the synoptics to trace his ancestry back through David, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Noah, Moses, or sorry, not Moses, um, Adam. Because this is a fulfillment of all of that prophecy, right? This, this is the point made in Galatians 3. Your seed is singular, right? The full, which means Christ. He came into his own, mean, he, means he was born among the Jews. He did his ministry mostly through the Jews. As a matter of fact, in John's Gospel, basically everything is taking place either in Jerusalem or not far outside. So in chapter 11, for example, when Lazarus is sick and dies, he goes to Bethany. Where's Bethany in relation to Jerusalem? It's like a suburb. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's just outside. It's an easy walk. It's not like uh, he's, he's spending all of his time in Capernaum like he is in, in some of the synoptics. He, John is happening in and around Judea, especially around Jerusalem. He comes to his own. And yet, those who are trying to kill Jesus and those who do kill Jesus are, it's not to his property. Um, so the, 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 the phrase used here is, um, it's, it's actually used in Esther, believe it or not, uh, chapter five, when, uh, when, uh, when he goes back to his house, he goes back to his own people. Um, it's almost, he, he goes back to his own verse 12. So. John talks about Jesus came into his own to the Jews, into the world, to humanity. Um, the world didn't know him. His own didn't receive him. But to those who did receive him. Now, if, if you don't like generalizations, you're going to really struggle reading the Bible. You've got to get over it. I'm sorry. That's just it. Like, there are generalizations in the Bible. Paul says Cretans are always liars. Like, and... This testimony is true. Uh, generalizations are there for a reason. They're like brooms. They sweep, which means they're not, they don't generally hold 
100% of the time. Now, all humanity is sinful. That generalization holds 100% of the time with the exception of Jesus, right? But he came into his own. His own did not receive him. Most of the Jews who heard the gospel did not believe. But we know for a fact that some did. Many did. I mean, after all, who's writing this gospel account? A Jew named John, right? The first 12 disciples were all Jewish men. St. Paul, the least of the, the apostles, was a Benjaminite, right? Um, you had Nicodemus, was a, was a disciple in secret mind. But, um, so it's, this is not a, a generalization that holds 100% of the time, but it is a generalization that is true. He came to his own, they didn't receive him. You're going to see Jesus in John, he'll start teaching, and then pretty soon, here come the Jews, they've been, they've been dogging him and they're picking up rocks, and he's got to escape, sometimes by, by means of a miracle. It's not the Greeks doing that. But the, the construction of this in this verse, in verse 12, indicates that there are those who did receive him, both among his own people and among the world. Because there are certainly people who are not Jews, like Luke, like Timothy. Yeah, I mean... The, 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 the hearers of, of Peter's magnificent Pentecost sermon were Jews. He points it. He says, you killed Jesus. You killed the Son of God. And they're torn. They said, what shall we do? And Peter says, be, you know, repent and be baptized, all of you, for the forgiveness of sins, right? And 3,000 were added to, that, to their number that day. Right. And those were um, exclusively or almost exclusively Jewish men. So some did. And that's the thing. To all who did receive him, and what does it mean to receive him? Yeah, it's to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ and to live according to his, his way. To those who did receive him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Yeah, but I would give that answer in the study Bible a C-. minus Because it is believing, but it's also walking. <laughs> We, we, we Lutherans are allergic to good works, but, but no, you're, you're entirely right. Faith is, faith is a huge deal in John's gospel. When you see the word faith used in the New Testament, it is, it is usually coming from one of John's books. Now, of course, Paul uses faith. Faith comes by, by hearing, right? But um, faith is a big, big word in all of John's writings. And faith is described as a gift given to us by the paraclete, by the helper. Yeah. I just wish the Lutherans would talk about like, because this is also a big deal in John living according to, to Jesus' way. Now, um, we have this word in the Gospels, begotten. For the longest time, I was never quite sure what begotten meant. So um, when you describe your mother, how you came forth from your mother, you use the word born. When you describe how you came forth from your father, you would use the word begotten. Right? God is our father. We're begotten of God. Not in the way that the word is begotten. We are not gods. We're not Mormons. Uh, <laughs> but we are like God. We're begotten. As a matter of fact, that's, that's going to be what Jesus tells Nicodemus. You have to be born or begotten of God. You have to be begotten again, born again. And John tells us, those who become children of God are born, begotten. How? Not of blood. Meaning, you can't just say, here's my family tree, and you can trace me all the way back to Abraham, and Abraham has the promise, so I'm good. This is what the Jews do in John 8. We have Abraham for our father, and, and Jesus says, big deal. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't, they didn't care for that. Uh, things, things intensify after John 8. It's, it's a pretty intense chapter, actually. But, um, and, and Jesus is saying that as a son of Abraham. He himself is born in the flesh as a descendant of Abraham. Really, it's the descendant of Abraham. And he says what? Your lineage doesn't get you anything before God. To be a child of God does not mean to be born in the natural way as a child of Abraham. Now, you do need to be a child of Abraham, but we learn in Galatians that means what? 
faith. To be a child of Abraham is to, to believe as Abraham did. Not, nor of the will of the flesh. Right? You want a good verse to keep in your back pocket against decision theology, there it is. Children of God are not born by will of the flesh. Unconverted man, natural man in the state of the fall, does not decide, does not make a decision to be born a child of God. Now, one of my favorite hymns, Jesus Priceless Treasure, will have us singing, Jesus is my choice, which is true. But who am I? I'm a Christian. I have the Holy Spirit. Do I want to do God's will? You bet I do. Perfectly? Nope. But I do. <laughs> but I do want to do God's will. I mean, this is, this is Roman 7 territory, right? I want to do good, but I keep finding myself doing stuff I didn't even want to do, but here I am, you know. Um, but I'm a child of God. I want to do His will. That, but that state within me of being a regenerate child of God did not come about because of my will. Rather, this is being born of God. What does all of this mean? Jesus is going to tell us when he tells Nicodemus in chapter 3. So next week, we'll spend some time in verse 14, one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Um, we'll talk about the incarnation. All right, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you. <laughs>